Welcome to the Center for Constitutional Studies panel on the idea of an Alberta sovereignty act. Uh, my name is Dr. Richard Maley. Uh, I'm the director of the center. Uh, and I'm really, really delighted to see so many of you here uh, in person, which is obviously reflective, I think, of the, the, the gravity of what we're here to talk about. Uh, so before we begin our conversation on sovereignty act, uh, I'd just like to start by acknowledging that the Center for Constitutional Studies is located in Edmonton on Treaty 6 territory. Uh, and the center accordingly acknowledges and honors uh, the ancestor traditions and the spirit uh, of um, the spirit that first drew indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Metis, Dakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Salto, and Inuit to this gathering today. And in acknowledging the territory that we're on, uh, we also acknowledge that we all enjoy the benefits of treaty, and we call upon the spirit and intent of treaty to maintain us in a stronger, more enduring or equal relationship. And of course, we recognize as well that my acknowledgments such as this one are one minuscule step in the ongoing process of reconciliation in Canada. Now, uh, before we get started, uh, I should say a few words about how uh, tonight's proceedings are going to work. Uh, so the plan is that I'll spend about 30 minutes uh, posing some hopefully pertinent questions for our three panelists. And we'll then open up the floor for about 30 minutes uh, from of questions from audience members. Uh, so if you're here in person and you have questions, just raise your hand at the end. And if you're joining us on Zoom, um, please post your questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom Tech of this. Uh, and I suspect we'll have a lot of questions for this one, so my apologies in advance uh, if you have questions that we don't quite manage to get to before our hour is up. Uh, so I think we're ready then to meet our three panelists. Uh, and their request, I'm going to keep this uh, very brief. Uh, so we're joined tonight by Professor Lisa Young uh, from the University of Calgary's Department of Poli-Sci, uh, Professor Jared Wesley at the end uh, from the University of Alberta's Department of Poli-Sci, and Professor Eric Adams from the University of Alberta's Faculty of Law. Uh, so please put your hands together uh, and extend a very warm welcome to Lisa Jared. So, uh, let's kick things off with Lisa. Uh, and Lisa, my first question for you is about the origin story of the Sovereignty Act concept. So where does the idea of the Alberta Sovereignty Act come from? Uh, and how does it relate to the many other proposals that we've seen over the years for addressing Western alienation? So that would include things like uh, Triple E Senate or changing the equalization formula. Uh, so where does the idea come from? Uh, and how does it differ from those other uh, historically relevant initiatives? Sure. Um, so when we look for the origins of the idea of the Sovereignty Act, um, we only need to look back a couple of years. Um, and, and that's relatively recent in the context of Alberta alienation, which of course goes back to, you know, really the formation of Alberta as a province. Um, but uh, when after, it, after the 2019 federal election, when the Liberals were re-elected, there was huge frustration, I think many of us recall, in, in Alberta. And there was lots of talk about separation, doing things differently. There were documents. There was the Buffalo Declaration, as you'll recall. And there was one, I think, fairly obscure document, the Free Alberta Strategy. And this was uh, written by two lawyers, uh, constitutional lawyers, and one political theorist, uh, my colleague Barry Cooper. And it really seemed to be on the fringe of the conversation, even in that period in 2019 and 2020. But it sets out this really bold and elaborate plan for the legislation that we're going to talk about tonight, other legislation that would accompany it, and a whole set of measures. It really thinks this whole thing through. So if you're interested in the Sovereignty Act, go and read the document that it comes from would be my uh, my pitch here in terms of how this fits in the the grand scheme of things uh, i spent a lot of time this week thinking about that question because there are a lot of ideas and, and how do we organize those and i think one way of organizing them is to think about some of the um, proposals that have come out of Western Canada that have really been intended to reform Canada, to make Canada more inclusive of the West. Some of us remember the West wants in. So ideas like the Tripoli Senate that both may, would, would make Canadian politics, uh, uh, at least in the eyes of the proposers, um, 
more amenable to the articulation of Western interests um, and would make Canada a better place from a, an Alberta or Western perspective. So, so there are these reformist impulses. But in the last 20 years, we've also seen impulses that I think of as, as retreats from Canada in some ways. And those would include the firewall letter from 2001 and now the Sovereignty Act, as well as proposals to separate, right? And all of these say, Canada is resistant to our ideas for reform. Canada is resistant to becoming more like Alberta. And so we need to take our marbles and, and stay home. We need to build a firewall. We need to assert our autonomy uh, inside the, the Confederation. And I think the, the peculiarity of these sort of retreats is that they're actually intended to really prompt a conversation about reform. They don't necessarily mean that, that people want to leave. But I do think that the, the Sovereignty Act fits into the, the tradition of the firewall in the sense of saying we're going to re retract ourselves and we are going to um, uh, you know, try to, to move the conversation forward that way. Um, it, there's similarity uh, between the uh, Sovereignty Act proposal and the equalization referendum that we had uh, just a year ago. Um, it, and these are what I call fantasy federalism. Um, it's wishful thinking. It's uh, trying to put forward an idea that wins huge support uh, from Albertans, but it's based on uh, at best a misunderstanding of the constitution, at worst a, a desire to mislead. Um, and I think that's you know, an important element here. So there's a similarity there. But the last point I wanna make, because this has been a very long answer to a short question, um, is that where this diverges is in its blatant unconstitutionality. And I won't say another word about that because I'm acutely aware that I'm sitting next to a constitutional lawyer. <laughs> I love the phrase fantasy federalism, by the way. Is that yours? It is. Uh, I need like a little trademark. <laughs> yeah, I, I might have to borrow it. Um, so I want to pivot there to Jared. Um, Jared, my opening question for you is, uh, I suppose, the big why question here. Uh, so why, strategically speaking, has the Smith campaign invested so much energy in the Sovereignty Act? Uh, I, I mean, is it is it really that popular in, in Alberta and is Smith's support for it really likely to pay off at the, the polls? Yeah, thanks. And thanks for everybody joining here and, and online. I would be remiss if I didn't note the irony that we're talking about this topic in Peter Lockheed Hall, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm struck by how Peter Lockheed might react to all of this. Um, so we, we've been in the field for uh, three, the better part of three years. And you said you've been part of this, my, my colleague. Theo Snagowski and, and, and Michelle Murata with the Viewpoint Alberta study. And those surveys show quite clearly that Albertans don't feel like they're treated fairly by the federal government, that they're undervalued or misunderstood by people in other parts of the country. Uh, I, I would use the word jilted more than angry. Some folks are angry. And I think a lot of those folks are the ones that we see um, online. Uh, and, and probably lining up at, at, at Daniel Smith rallies, but I wouldn't characterize the entire province as being angry. Now, Daniel Smith isn't the first politician to try to tap into this kind of anger. As, as Lisa mentioned, we've had strategies that have emphasized how the West wants in, in other words, trying to build bridges with the rest of Canada. We've also had strategies that have wanted to fight back, right? Punch back, as, um, as I would characterize the... Uh, uh, the fair deal approach from, from Jason Kenney uh, primarily. I think that um, Daniel Smith's approach, this free Alberta strategy, which, which the Sovereignty Act seems to be pretty well embedded in, is to just takes this um, to, to a whole other level. Uh, if I can use an analogy here, uh, if, if Preston Manning wanted to have more Albertans on the ice for this hockey game, and Jason Kenney, want, Jason Kenney wanted us to get our elbows up a little, uh, Daniel Smith seems to be asking us to take off our skates and take the puck home, uh, which I think is, is actually quite defeatist and not in tune with what Albertans uh, want out of, out of their deal with Confederation. Our surveys show quite clearly that bridge building approaches in particular, seeking more 
seats in the House of Commons or a restructuring of the Senate to more to more uh, adequately uh, represent Alberta within federal institutions are far more unpopular than measures like on the far end of the spectrum set separatism, but even measures that would see us walled off from the rest of the country, including, uh, you know, abandoning the RCMP agreements, uh, abandoning the CPP and so on. So I don't think we have a firm idea of, of what public opinion is on the Sovereignty Act yet. And I think it would be premature because we don't even know what it is yet. I'm sure Eric, you're going to talk about this. But to me, I don't think that the Smith campaign is capturing the mood of the general electorate. I think she's capturing the mood of folks uh, who are angry enough to either build a firewall or, or to separate from Canada in some instances. And, and we have some surveys that show that among separatists, she's actually quite popular. So um, it'll be interesting, I think, to see how, when she uh, comes up with this legislation and pivots to try to, to, to campaign in a general election, uh, whether she's able to, to bring the rest of Alberta along with her. Of course, all of this, we're presuming <laughs> that tomorrow night, um, she, she is named Premier of Alberta, which I, I put a, a question mark on. Um, stranger things have happened in this province. Holsters uh, have been wrong uh, in the past. But overall, I don't, I don't think that this angry, mean, um, quite honestly defeatist approach to, to uh, carving out Alberta's place in Confederation really matches the tone of the moment. So I'll come to Eric in, in a moment for a double question, uh, but I want to turn back to Lisa again. Uh, Lisa, Western alienation is, is nothing new in Alberta politics, uh, but is there something unique about this particular expression of it? So in other words, is the alienation that's fueling support for the Sovereignty Act today, similar to what we've seen in the past or different? And if it's different, uh, what role is being played by things like you know, the rise of global populism or the spread of misinformation online? Sure. So I think when we think about why this idea, why now, how is it taken off, you know, in the corners of the province that it has, there are a couple of things. I think the first is that I, we need to think about the continuity between the sovereignty, uh, or sorry, the um, uh, equalization referendum last year that promised that you know if we just go out and vote um you know then then we're going to open up the constitution and talk about equalization which we knew not to be true but th that promise was made and nothing has happened so for those folks who are really concerned about this who believe that promise there's a frustration nothing's happened so we need to up the ante so that's that's one piece of it but the the other piece of this i think speaks to the moment that we're in and you know we don't know and and i just want to be really clear that this is somewhat speculative because we don't have survey data about um, people who are UCP members, we don't know specifically who Danielle Smith is, is appealing to on this front and why this idea has taken off with them, but we can connect some dots here. And we're in an era where in, uh, you know, among some segments of the population, trust in uh, traditional media is very low and there are readily available alternative sources of media. The Western Standard uh, comes to mind, uh, Rebel News comes to mind, and that is putting forward a set of ideas and an interpretation that are really quite different from what we're hearing listening to mainstream media. So that's one piece. There is the internet and you know the ability to find a set of facts that you are looking for, whether they are in fact true or not. Um, and, and that certainly, again, feeds into uh, the notion that you, know, you can have somebody running for the leadership of the governing party who will say, of course, this is constitutional. I've read the constitution and that's that, that it's accepted, right? So that it's, it's that, you know, find your own facts kind of uh, place that we're in. We're in a moment where norms, the idea that, you know, you have to respect the constitution, even if you find it frustrating, is increasingly in question. It's passe. If we look south of the border, what happened during the, the, the Trump uh, administration, we can look to that. And we're in an era where there's a rise of the so-called sovereign citizen movement. Um, and, and this is essentially a, a movement that says, look, laws that I don't agree with don't apply to me. And you know, there are echoes of that in, in the Sovereignty Act. So it is this very particular moment where this kind of populism that's driven by 
misinformation um, and and has a velocity to it that we might not have seen in other times, uh, you know, is very much uh, influencing people's views. So I want to bring Eric in there. Eric, I promised you a double question, double question coming up. Uh, so Eric, how clear a sense do we have at this point of what might be in this proposed sovereignty act and, and of how it might operate in practice? Thank you. Uh, and thank you everybody for being here. And uh, you know, when you bring a constitutional lawyer, the first thing that person should be is a little bit pedantic, which I will now be to say, Daniel Smith will not be the premier tomorrow night. <laughs> um, uh, she may in fact win that leadership vote, um, but she will not be the premier until sworn in by the Lieutenant governor, which would not happen for probably a week or, or so. So Jason Kenney will remain the premier until he resigns. And that's not happening tomorrow night. What was the question? No, <laughs> I, I know what the question was. Uh, what do we know about the Sovereignty Act? Well, it's been an interesting political strategy for this candidate to, on the one hand, say, uh, this will be my main plank of my legislative agenda, and then push for details to say, well, of course, that act doesn't uh, exist because private citizens, and at the moment, Ms. Smith is simply that, a private citizen, a member of a, of a political party, she doesn't have access to the civil service to draft something like the Sovereignty Act. Uh, and so no such act, in fact, uh, exists. What do we know about what she's proposed? Well, we know the public comments she's made about that act. And uh, as Lisa has mentioned, we know its origins in a free Alberta strategy, which has a document which very clearly says uh, that there will be a Sovereignty Act and, and this will be its central premise. Uh, and then maybe most revealingly, we have Ms. Smith's press release in early September, which laid out some of the mechanics of what she proposes. So let me talk a little bit about um, uh, the act based on those three sources. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll begin with a small caveat, is that there have been some comments by Ms. Smith, especially in the last week, that she would have to speak with caucus to make sure that this act was constitutional. Um, there are, have been some subtle signs, perhaps because of some uh, nervousness about uh, the popularity of this act within her party, that, um, that the act may moderate somewhat. We don't know the answer to that yet, but there have been a few si signals. Based on the press release, it, it tells us that in essence, the legislature would be able to pass a motion. She calls them a special motion. Sidebar, you don't actually need an act to be able to have a special motion in the legislature. Legislatures can just pass motions if they want. But in any event, the act says we will pass a motion. That motion will, if a federal law, a law of the, of the Parliament of Canada, is thought to be unconstitutional because it invades the separation of powers or because it interferes with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. If the government and therefore the legislature who votes to agree with the government that, that there is a federal law that is unconstitutional, then, and this is the next part, then Alberta will refuse to enforce that law or take other steps, those are a little bit unclear, to oppose that legislation. So it's a, a a uh, vote in the legislature. She says it will be a free vote that any time a federal law is deemed to be unconstitutional, then the legislature of Alberta would be able to declare that federal law does not effectively apply or cannot be enforced in Alberta. It's placed in a kind of abeyance, put in some other room, stopped at the border. And uh, Ms. Smith says, well, let's wait and see what the, if the federal government wants to really force our hand, they'll, they'll have to bring some kind of legal challenge to uh, uh, make that law work in Alberta. Um, one, of the, one of the especially concerning parts of the press release, among a number of concerning parts from my perspective, is what she says would happen after the courts intervened. And this has not got much attention. Um, she said, if the courts then ultimately say the legislature was wrong about declaring that act unconstitutional, uh, she says that 
the government and legislature will have to determine how to respond. Understanding the legal implications such a decision could cause. And there I'm quoting from her. That's not, we will comply with the courts. That's not what is being said. What is being said is we may or may not comply with a ruling from the courts after we've declared a law unconstitutional. It's a signaling, I think, a willingness to at least contemplate the open uh, uh, refusal to comply with uh, a judicial order of uh, a Canadian court. I find that uh, uh, chilling. So uh, what we know about this act is, is I think, uh, something uh, deeply subversive to a number of key principles to our Canadian constitutional order. So this next question is a two-parter. Um, the first part, very simply, is can, can you say a little bit more about the exact way in which you think this might fall file of the constitution? Um, I think Rubar in a, a sub question then, aside from the possibility of the validation by the courts, are there other legal obstacles that the Sovereignty Act might encounter on its journey from campaign proposal to provincial law? Okay, the first part is, uh, what's precisely is unconstitutional uh, about that act? Well, the first thing I'll say, to be fair to Ms. Smith, the press release says it's clearly constitutional. So we disagree on this. Uh, um, I think that uh, it's um, not a close call. Here's why. Uh, the separation of powers is a, a foundational feature of our constitutional order. Don't take my word for it. That's what the Supreme Court of Canada says. It's an essential feature, that's a quote, of our constitution. What is the concept of this separation of powers? Well, it's that each role, legislative, executive, Judicial has a separate and distinct function in making our constitution work. Legislatures make laws, the executive implements those laws, and it's the judi judiciary, courts, independent, who have to listen to evidence and hear from both sides, who make the determination about whether those laws comply with the constitution or not. What else did the Supreme Court of Canada say? Well, that in each of those core responsibilities, the other level of government cannot interfere with those functionings. That means courts can't become legislatures. Legislatures can't take on executive powers, but it also means legislatures can't be courts. They can't issue constitutional declarations and they most certainly cannot purport to issue a constitutional remedy. What's a, what's a constitutional remedy? Well, it says that the law won't apply here. That, that that's not a real law. That's a job we give exclusively to courts and it's a task they undertake with all degree of seriousness. Why? Because it's a big deal to say that a law passed by a democratically uh, elected body is not gonna have the force of law. We say in our political constitutional system, when parliament passes a law, that's a law until a court tells us otherwise. That same, that's, that, that's also true of, of the legislature. We comply with their laws. Let's imagine a world in which that's not the case, in which a legislature could say that federal law of Canada is unconstitutional. Well, Parliament has said that's a law. The Alberta legislature has said, no, that's not a law. And what is a citizen supposed to do with that information? What is a, a city of Edmonton police officer who's now been uh, sworn to uphold the criminal code of Canada. And there's a provision of that criminal code that that police officer doesn't know whether I should enforce it or not enforce it, or is it the law or is it not the law? What do I do? What do I do next? It's a recipe for confusion and, and a deep, I think, subversion of what we call the rule of law. Secondly, relatedly, what happens when the legislature disagrees with this declaration of unconstitutionality with a court? We've now created two bodies in competition with one another. And you, it, there's a danger of eroding the fundamental respect that Canadians have for the courts if we say, well, 
what does the dude say in the Big Lebowski? That's just like your opinion, man, because <laughs> the legislature says that's unconstitutional. You're saying that's constitutional. You know, maybe I, maybe I want to believe this legislature. Maybe you don't know what you're talking about. And especially where a provincial government is saying, we may or may not, we'll have to decide how we respond to court orders. A remarkable moment in Canadian constitutional history. I can't think of an analog of a, of a provincial government uh, openly contemplating, refusing, following judicial orders. It's not a good moment for Canadian constitutional democracy. I'll say this more quickly, because I've said a lot. Finally, federalism. This idea that when we live in Canada, we're governed by more than one level of government. That's what it means to be in a federal, uh, a, a, a federal country with two levels of democratically elected institutions that make law. Sometimes we may like the laws that those bodies make, and sometimes we may not. How do we deal with that? Through the exercise of our rights to vote and to participate in the democratic process. Not to say that one of those levels of government doesn't get to uh, impact this place, this special Alberta nation, which may not have to comply with federal laws. That's just not a vision of the country that is compliant with our Canadian constitutional understanding. Okay, you also asked about other obstacles. There are a few. One of them is uh, the caucus. And our legislative assemblies can say no. And each of them is invested with an oath to uphold the law. They cannot do unconstitutional things. I hope the members of the Legislative Assembly take that seriously. The Attorney General of the province has a constitutional obligation to ensure that the acts of the legislature comply with the Constitution. Um, I hope the Attorney General takes that role uh, seriously. The civil service, when tasked with drafting a law and given potentially unconstitutional instructions, have obligations to speak truth to power, to be fearless but loyal in their implementation of, of government uh, uh, policy. But a number of those drafters will themselves be lawyers that uh, are tasked with upholding the law. I think we'll see what happens. And it may be that some of those obstacles moderate the principles uh, that uh, so far I fear are taking the province in an unconstitutional direction. So, uh, Jared, I'd like to bring you back to the conversation again, which is you've worked in intergovernmental relations. And that gives you obviously a unique perspective on the question of where we might go from here as a political community and as a federation. Uh, so assuming that the Sovereignty Act project continues to move forward, assuming it keeps gaining momentum, what advice would you give federal government and other provincial governments about how to handle it? You know, I'm first of all, happy to see many of the, my former colleagues in intergovernmental relations in the room today. Um, and um, I think they would agree with me, this is a, a, a very odd, um, odd would be a charitable word, uh, dynamic to add to intergovernmental relations today. Um, my advice to the federal government uh, would be, let's see whether this act is actually first passed, and secondly, whether it's brought into force, because there's still a big question as to whether the government may pass it as a means of trying to live up to its, its campaign promise, um, but leave it um, not uh, brought into force, which is what happened with the turn off the taps law, which was also at the time seen by many people to be um, unconstitutional, at least brushing up against the Constitution. Um, so in the meantime, uh, you know, uh, there are obvious risks for the federal government uh, to start weighing in, uh, in in opposition to this government, given that this is the whole purpose of the political strategy is to provoke some kind of negative reaction from the rest of Canada. I thought the government of Canada did a great job of handling the outcome of the um, referendum to remove equalization from the Constitution. Uh, the response was was silence, and and it didn't provide oxygen um, to that um, to that particular to that particular strategy. I think for my for the provincial governments across across Canada, I, I would like to see them 
reinforce the norm of consensus, which has been driving intergovernmental relations in Canada since since the very beginning. For folks that don't know what consensus is, there's so I see some of my former students in the room who have heard me give this consensus speech before in intergovernmental relations and federalism class. Um, but consensus is not uh, unanimity. First of all, it doesn't mean when when governments get together and decide they're going to launch some new national program or to collaborate with one another, everybody has to agree 100% with it. Um, it also does not mean everyone somebody has a veto. Consensus is best described as was put to me by by one of the chief negotiators in the uh, patriation uh, round of constitutional negotiations as like sailing the ship. Consensus is like sailing the ship. While most uh, provinces may be on board and want to leave the port, not everyone may want to be on board that ship. Some might even want to stay on dry land or pull their, their own personal flag off of, off of that ship. But they'll still agree to see that ship leave the port. And they'll agree that it's better to move forward than to stand still. Now, for decades, intergovernmental relations in Canada has functioned on this principle. Does this mean it moves more slowly than if we had a majoritarian system or we simply vote as provinces whether we want to implement a national strategy? Certainly. But it works even in times when there are committed separatists around the table. The PQ government in Quebec was able to participate in consensus-based negotiations to achieve national agreements on climate change, energy, healthcare, social programs, and fiscal transfers. Those of us that remember that time will, will, will know that Quebec would always place an asterisk on, on communiques that came out of those agreements, but the agreements would still move forward. And more importantly, Quebec would still benefit from, being, from, that, from seeing that national initiative move forward. Uh, moves like Kenny's equalization referendum um, and Smith's Sovereignty Act are completely antithetical to that approach to consensus building. To continue on that analogy, the Sovereignty Act is the equivalent of demanding that the ship remain in the harbor and that it be sold off for parts. And for folks that are committed to the national project in Canada, the majority of provinces, um, they won't go for that. But the zero-sum populism that, that, uh, that Lisa talked about that seems to be hardwired into conservative populists these days, including uh, the Danielle Smith camp, is such that you can't be even seen to compromise with anyone else. That is seen to be traitorous. Not only do you have to win in everything that you engage in, but you have to make sure that everyone else is seen to lose. Uh, that is a recipe for, uh, for disaster in, in intergovernmental relations in Canada, but it should sound familiar to folks that have ever read The Art of the Deal. Right? <laughs> that mentality of dog eat dog, I must win, you must lose, has unfortunately captured conservative establishment parties uh, north of the border as it has south of the border. And as one person south of the border mentioned, one journalist said, Republicans have reached the point where they don't want their elected leaders to solve problems. They want them to hurt the people they hate. And that's the worrying trail uh, for me uh, as we move forward. Um, yeah. Leave off on a more optimistic note, but there's more questions, I'm sure. Well, I've got one more question. It's not, I don't think, going to take us to a more optimistic place, <laughs> but let's give it a shot. Um, so I'm going to go down the line on this question uh, and ask each of you the same question, starting with Lisa. Uh, and basically, it's the big question of where does this potentially lead? Uh, and in particular, you know, whether this is actually a step in the direction of Alberta sovereignty. So, uh, Lisa, coming to you first, is this potentially setting us on the road to sovereignty? Potentially, but I think not likely. Um, I, I think I, I agree entirely with Eric's analysis of the many things that stand between us and promulgation and, and enactment of uh, the, the Sovereignty Act. Um, I think that the you know, parliamentary government is going to do its thing and, and force Smith to introduce a piece of legislation that probably doesn't do the things that, that this talks about. Um, that having been said, 
even the conversation that we've had about this over the past month and that we're likely to have over the, the coming months really does let a whole new idea, a set of ideas out of the bag or out of the barn. And um, it's very difficult to get them back in after that, you know, and, and so there's, there's new ideas in the lexicon. Now, the, the real question is what direction does Alberta politics take over the next year, two years? The Sovereignty Act might be something that we sort of look back on and, and chuckle and say, oh, remember, you know, the Smith government, it lasted for eight months and it tried to do this thing and it didn't happen and there are people who are still upset about it. If Smith is reelected and actually moves forward on this, well, then, it, you know, this, this is clearly the road to sovereignty. And if, you know, if you read the document that it's based on, it is clearly proposing this as a way to get to the objective of Alberta patriotism, essentially, and, and an Alberta state. Eric, same question. Uh, where, where are we heading? Is this setting us off on the road to sovereignty if it moves forward? Uh, I tend to think not, because uh, we'll see what happens in the days ahead. But my sense is, is that um, while this may have been good strategy, we'll see. Maybe it was a good strategy to win a particular leadership race <laughs> at a very particular moment. Um, it may well succeed in that endeavor, but I don't, um, and I could be proven wrong, but I don't get the sense that this is a popular uh, agenda for uh, the province. And I think that especially when its adherents, if it comes to pass, uh, discover all of, all of the um, legal obstacles that will will deal with it. And it may well come before a court of law. And I, I don't doubt that a court, if it exists in this form, would find it unconstitutional. And so it, it may be a short lived story, uh, a lot of fury signifying nothing as a as a constitutional matter. But I will pick up on something that Lisa said, which is that the openness of our political leaders to even introduce the Constitution as no longer a governing framework, but in fact, a just another power play that's up for grabs and debate is a worrisome trend in our politics. When we, and conservatives used to be more attached to our institutions than liberals. And we're now living in an era when, when segments of conservative politics have abandoned institutions. Um, and I don't know that that's a good uh, uh, development in our political culture. Jared? Yeah, again, we're, we're in Peter Lockheed Hall and I can't imagine Peter Lockheed's reaction to this. So I guess we don't have to imagine. He had separatists in his time and was able to champion um, Alberta within a strong Canada and vice versa. Um, look, I mean, we see this play out in the United States. At some point, populist conservatives lose control of their ability to, to, to keep their, their followers in check, and they succumb to escalating demands, right? Again, another famous conservative constitutionalist, John Diefenbaker, famously said, the maximum demands of today become the minimum demands of tomorrow. So if you look at politicians like Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Donald Trump, they start off making some pretty outlandish pro promises, and they eventually get thwarted by some institution, which they then convert into animosity towards those institutions, the courts will be blamed, right? Um, but in order to capture, sorry, maintain the attention of their followers, they need to constantly ramp up their demands. They become more and more outlandish. And if they're not, there'll be somebody else out there to replace them that will, that will carry that forward. So in this perspective, I think conservatives in this province have got, they, well, they have a, they've already made their choice. I guess we all find out tomorrow what that choice is. There may be a few more opportunities, but not many for them to, for them to uh, come back into the constitutional order. I guess for me, the, the, broad, the more important immediate concern is that um, this fantasy federalism, as you say, a constitutional cause play is what I call it, but um, it's deliberately a distraction from what Albertans are clearly saying uh, are far more important issues facing this province, affordability, climate change, Healthcare. These are the issues that come top of mind for Albertans these days, and this is a distraction. It's not the first time an Alberta premier will try to, to pick a fight with Ottawa in order to distract from turmoil at home and externalize externalize opposition. But this time, as Eric said, they're bringing the constitution into 
uh, into play, which is which is very very worrisome. I think that's the perfect place to move on to the Q and A section of tonight's proceedings. So let's start with a question from an audience member, Gregor. Two questions: the first, practical; the second, speculative. Uh, how does a province respond um, to a federal government which is governing uh, by regulation rather than by law? And the second question is speculative. If, if Canada uh, was a confederation of nine provinces and plus territories, would Albertans vote to join? Under the current uh, constitution of governance. I can take the second one first. I think a lot, a, a lot of folks forget, although my students never do because I test them. Um, <laughs> my students forget that the, the provinces weren't created by the federal government. The federal government was a creation of the provinces, right? Um, but at the same time, the provinces, when they came together in confederation, agreed to, to these rules of federalism. Um, that would allow, allow us to have uh, local autonomy over certain matters and then allow the national government to govern over, 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 over national matters. Would Albertans choose to uh, join Confederation now? Um, I, well, it's a hypothetical question, but the survey results are quite clear. Albertans see themselves as Canadian. Um, I think another worrisome trend in this particular leadership race was politicians openly asking Albertans to choose between being uh, Canadian first or Albertan first. Albertans on the, on the whole, vast majority reject the premise. They have dual identities and it's not just Canadian or Albertan, it's Edmontonian as we were talking about this afternoon, it's Calgarian, it's uh, I'm a North American, it's I'm, I'm, a, I'm from, from Europe. So this identity politics, I think politicians, particularly in Canada at this moment, are, are very um, unwise, I think, to try to make people make choices like that. And if I can just add a footnote to this before we give Eric the hard question. Um, <laughs> it, I think, first of all, um, you know, some of the public opinion research that Jared and I have done demonstrates that, you know, 60% of the people who, who we surveyed, a random sample of Albertans, basically can be characterized as, as federalists if you have to put them in a box. So that's a majority. Uh, about 20% would like to see Alberta with more autonomy inside a federation, and about 20% would like to separate. But you know, in the context of would they choose to join Canada? That says 60% probably yes. But I also want to um, uh, repeat something that I, I heard uh, former Mayor Nahadnechi say. And that is a reminder that a growing percentage of the Alberta population are newcomers to Canada. And they came to Canada. They didn't come to Alberta, right? And that says something about the draw of Canada. And when we think about the demographic future of this province, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. As as, as well, obviously, um, you know, Indigenous people living uh, in, in what we call Alberta, yes. um, who, <laughs> yeah. uh, who would have a very different view of, of this. And James Bay Cree in, in the Quebec referendum is a perfect example of this. If Canada is divisible, so is Quebec. If Canada is divisible, first question should go to First Nations, Métis people, I think. Um, thanks for the question, it, it had me think of something I meant to say, which is that <clears throat> one of the accusations by the Smith campaign is that, you know, the government of Canada is passing unconstitutional laws, um, unconstitutional laws or unconstitutional regulations. It, it doesn't much matter from a, from a constitutional perspective. We have a system that can deal with that, which is that you can challenge those laws in court. You can have the power of issuing a reference cases. Sometimes when provinces say that a federal law is unconstitutional, they're right. But lots of times, actually, they're wrong in, if we go by what uh, the courts of law say. So um, I think in a federation, there will be differences between governments uh, from time to time about where the lines of those constitutional, uh, uh, where those lines of the constitution are, and, uh, and they can turn to the courts to help sort them out. And they do. And that system works. So we'll do a question from Zoom here, uh, just going back to something that was touched on already. Uh, for all panelists, what are your thoughts on the potential impacts of the Sovereignty Act 
on Indigenous peoples in Alberta? Well, I, I've actually had some conversations with um, bona fide separatists, not just folks that, that attend um, conferences put on during a leadership race, but rather people that are committed to the cause and actually out there stumping for it. Um, I think they have uh, a nuanced understanding of, of, of the negotiation that would need to take place with Indigenous people. I think we're, we're wrong to think they haven't started thinking about this. They have. It's one of the reasons why there's a, a I would say, the leading edge of the separatist movement in Alberta does not want to form a republic. They want to retain um, they want to retain a connection to the crown because they recognize that treaties are, are the foundation of, of, uh, you know, of land and, and, and power here in, in, in Alberta. So um, what do you think the, the implications of separatism? Was that the question of, or, or of this entire debate of so the sovereignty, sovereignty act? Well, sovereignty. yeah, I mean, yeah. that's, this is the first time that we've actually heard the word sovereignty thrown around in Alberta like this. We've heard it in some, in some extent, to some extent in Quebec, but sovereignty means something very, very different to, to Indigenous people. And it would, it would be a, a, a constitutional quagmire to try to, to, try to tease this out. You know, if if we go back to the um, the the document, uh, the Free Alberta Strategy, um, where this idea comes from, and it, it essentially says that you know the rationale for the Sovereignty Act is is twofold. First of all, that um, being part of confederation is, you know, and I quote here, economic terrorism, um, that, that we have to pay into equalization. But the second really has to do with Alberta's ability to uh, develop natural resources projects, right? It, it's about building pipelines and, and uh, um, other energy uh, sector developments. And so that, I think, when we Think about the question of the impact on Indigenous people at a practical level. I think what this says is that the government of Canada has passed laws that privilege Indigenous people to stop these projects be, uh, uh, you know, going through their, their land uh, that require greater consultation. And so Alberta saying that they can simply exempt themselves from federal laws and go ahead and, and build these projects, uh, I think challenges in very profound ways um, it, the rights of Indigenous people and, and uh, their ability to uh, maintain their sovereignty. Um, you know, so that's a, in practical terms. I think there are also some symbolic mm -hmm. insults, but uh, I think that it's a little harder to tease out for me to tease out what those are. I'll, I'll just concur with my colleagues, I agree. <laughs> All right, can we get another audience question right here? Yeah, I have a question about, um, maybe for Professor Adams more so, but it's about um, the idea that the like, lieutenant governor could always just like refuse to assent to the law. Yep. So I'm kind of wondering, like, I know that that's something that hasn't happened in a long time, but as a convention, is that something that we could see happen? And if you do see it happen, um, like, I, I would imagine that's not going to go over super well, just given that, like, <laughs> I mean, they're more so like a bigger head. Their position is generally seen as being more symbolic. Right. So it's a great question, and it, it entered into political debate when the Lieutenant Governor responded to a reporter's question that uh, she would indeed take a look uh, uh, at the Sovereignty Act. Um, my view on this is that, um, is that, uh, the granting of royal assent by the lieutenant governor um, on the advice of uh, the, the, the premier and, and, and the cabinet is uh, something that she must comply with. But for a very small reserve power, which does exist to save the constitution from dangerously unconstitutional uh, acts. Um, when do you get to the threshold of dangerously unconstitutional? I think that's an open and interesting uh, question. Um, uh, I'm not prepared to say that, that, that the Sovereignty Act reaches that threshold based on the press release, but it, I suppose it could. Let's, for example, imagine an act that said, the Alberta Court of Appeal cannot strike down this law because we don't listen to their constitutional judgments anymore. Can a lieutenant governor pass that act, give grant royal assent? Well, the, the, the argument might be no, she can't, because simply allowing the courts to then deal with that potential unconstitutionality 
would itself create a kind of constitutional crisis where the law itself has denied their ability to do so. So you could imagine scenarios like that, where she, she by virtue of the dangerousness of the act, simply cannot uh, uh, follow the normal protocols of granting royal assent. I don't think, though, that there is any discretion because she or her advisors feel that the act may be unconstitutional. That, that's not the threshold. That's not her role. We have a judicial system to play that role. And any time the lieutenant governor elects to use the extraordinary reserve powers, it has to be because there's been a calculated decision that her using those powers, which will, as you, I think, astutely said, will occasion their own level of political crisis is the better alternative than the crisis occasioned by the passage of the act. And, and that's a pretty difficult calculus to, to meet, but it, it does exist. Got another Zoom question, um, and then we'll take another one in person. Uh, I assume that this one's for Eric. Uh, so Eric, given that the Supreme Court has suggested that unwritten principles cannot provide the basis to invalidate laws, why would the Alberta Sovereignty Act be struck down as unconstitutional? So I suppose the question is, which provisions as opposed to principles does it violate? Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, for the lawyers in the room or those uh, uh, who are on their way, um, in the city of Toronto uh, case, the Supreme Court of Canada stepped back slightly from the idea that unwritten principles form an independent basis on which to strike down legislation. I don't think a violation of the separation of powers or the principle of federalism are simply unwritten principles that uh, would cause the court to say, well, there's not enough here to invalidate these laws. That is both the separation of powers, the idea that there's a legislature an executive and a judiciary, and federalism, that we have two levels of government, both of those features, which may have some unwritten dimensions, but they are suffused through the written provisions of the Constitution Act of, of 1867. So there's no concern I have that a court faced with something like a sovereignty act would say, well, that's just an unwritten principle. I can't do anything about that. Um, the separation of powers is in the written architecture of the creation of the institutions in the constitution. Federalism, the division of powers between section 90, 91 and 92 uh, are written into the text of the constitution, which is why I, I wouldn't be concerned that uh, a court couldn't strike down the law on, on either of those or, or likely both of those uh, bases. Let's take another in-person question again, right here. <clears throat> so uh, this is the first time <clears throat> that provincial governments have threatened to pass laws that they had a pretty good idea were unconstitutional, or even pass laws that they knew were unconstitutional and had been struck down by the court. So if you go back to the Depression era in Alberta, the social credit government attempted to regulate banks in a way that was unconstitutional, attempted to regulate the press in a way that was unconstitutional. Well, that government in uh, Quebec after the Charter came into force tried to uh, invoke Section 33, the Charter, in respect of all Quebec laws, and the Supreme Court said, can't do that. So, so is this part of that historical um, tension between uh, provincial governments and federal governments, or is this something different? And if so, what about it? Just very quickly drawing on what you read from the Free Alberta strategy, it's it's that in all of those other cases, the governments had agreed to the to abide by court decisions. The might an exception might be Quebec, right? Who still to this day disputes the the constitutionality of the Clarity Act, but but they didn't take steps to to didn't take step what is what is the quote steps beyond that and we'll decide what we're going to do so i think that the, the threats of of subsequent action are different here and i think that the 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 drumming up of a base to be angry at the courts for taking that extra step i think is at a different level today than it was back then certainly aberhart 
knew that the courts were part of his big shots that he was taking shots at. But once the courts had struck it down, they moved on. I'm not convinced that these folks will move on or that their base will let them move on. I'll just add a, a footnote to that, which is when you read the Free Alberta strategy, one of the, the core elements is a rejection of the legitimacy of the courts. And they're referred to as, you know, the federally appointed courts. And you know, there's the idea that starts to make things unravel because you don't need to listen to the courts because they're all just part of the, the federal conspiracy. And I, I would say too that there, there is a distinction between when governments enact legislation that they worry may or may not be constitutional, but but that there's a plausible constitutional argument, which is what I think they look for. Uh, with their drafters and their, and their civil servants. Yeah, you know, the advice may be we're, 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 we're close to the line, maybe we're even over the line, but is there a strong, plausible constitutional argument that we can make in, defend, in defending this legislation in the House uh, and, and ultimately in, in court? And when governments, if that is what happens, give up that by articulating a law that is a frontal assault on simply core foundational principles of the constitution. And don't take my word for it, the, the architect uh, of this, uh, Barry Cooper in a, in a National Post editorial says, the whole point is to be unconstitutional. That's why this strategy is going to work because we no longer want to play this game with the rest of this country. Well, that's, a, that's an argument that you can have and that's a position you can hold but it's not a legal argument. It's one that to my mind says, you're interested in a constitutional referendum on whether or not you erect a different set of rules to govern this place and this country. I'm a Democrat. I think we can and should have those conversations if that is what uh, people want to have. Um, people will vote with their feet if that's what Alberta decides, uh, that if that's the conversation Alberta wants to have, but let's have that conversation. But let's not winking and nodding in a cynical fashion say, let's do unconstitutional things because, hey, there's no one, there's no constitutional jail out there. Let's break this. And if someone makes us stop, well, we got what we wanted out of this, which is to play tough. Um, I think that's deeply unfortunate. I, I, had, I had a question. Like, speaking of the Democratic woman of all this, we don't know her timeline if she wins. Or, you know, we don't know the details either. But in the what if scenario, she wins and she tries to do this six months before the next election. So, what's the Democratic basis for that? She's won on a narrow slice of the province. She does this big thing that may or may not, but could possibly uh, take us down a road many the majority, as they sort of say, don't really want to go. How, how do we democratically, what's the Democratic calculus there? How do we achieve what's it? It, uh, maybe an unpopular opinion. It's absolutely democratic for her to do that. Absolutely, Are we, under our system, she she is. I mean, the act itself may very well be unconstitutional, but, but she in twenty nineteen, right in, in twenty nineteen, Albertans went to the polls. Right. They elected eighty seven MLAs, as you said, and somebody said in their opening remarks. Those eighty seven MLAs on every piece of legislation have to weigh in and they'll have the opportunity to weigh in on this one more broadly if they don't think that that whoever wins tomorrow night is fit to govern there are mechanisms in place to topple that person's government so it is ab we are absolutely in a demo this is a democratic act we all may disagree with it it may very well be unconstitutional but she has every power to do that she just seek the legislature. Right? No, that's not according to our. To, I mean, that's you. You may disagree with me. If there's a constitutional norm, or a, let alone a convention that that governs that, but no, Albertans trotted the polls, elected more conservatives than not. If they didn't realize that there was a possibility that that the leader would be replaced midstream, they sure know now, and <laughs> and they should vote accordingly. I, I tell as many people as I can: elections have consequences. The, uh, there is a convention that says that she uh, has to seek a seat. Um, uh, the timelines of that are like all, in all things uh, constitutional convention wise, 
a, a little vague, but it's it's um, it's not. I think the next provincial election is too far away. That would mean breach of that convention. People talk in terms of is it four months, six months might be the outer limit of that. Right. I, I think it, I think I'd be more comfortable with something a little more aggressive in terms of calling a by election, um, which they have every power to to do. Um, but we, there's no question that we will have a if she wins. We will have a premier without a seat in the legislature. Um, I agree with Jared that, of course, it's democratic in the sense that the, the legislature would have to enact it, and that's a democratically elected body. I will say, and I'd be interested in my colleagues' views on this, I can't think of, a, of, an, of an analogous situation where an, an individual coming in to take over a political party adopted a radically different strategy uh, for that legislative agenda, yeah. um, one that was not part of the uh, a slate uh, in the last general uh, much camp the culture, campaign. You know? um, and when she's been pressed about that, she said the equalization referendum and the fair deal panel gives me the mandate to do that. And I don't think that that's a fair characterization of either of those um, processes. Um, the declaration of sovereignty, the declaration that Alberta is a nation within a nation, and that will be refusing to follow federal law has never been discussed in any of those four. So for me, I think it's democratic in one sense, it's the legislature, but it's for me deeply troubling if you're committed to some core principles of democracy. And that's a beautiful lead in because I can think of an example like that. And all we have to do is to go to the mother of all parliaments right now um, in, in the UK, where there, there was a very similar and mercifully quicker uh, process of getting rid of Boris Johnson, um, bringing in uh, the new prime minister, Truss, um, who then in, uh, introduced a budget that was pretty far out of line from what people expected and you know what was considered to be what the government had a mandate. And I haven't followed it all that closely, but my understanding is that backbench MPs have then played their appropriate role in a democratic system, and this is what Jared's getting at, to basically say to the government, no, 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 I don't think we're gonna vote for that budget. Right, and that of course would topple the government. So my understanding is that they're they're backing away from some of the the measures in that budget, which is parliamentary democracy working its magic. So the question now is, are the MLAs who sit in the UCP caucus going to play a similar role, or are they going to support a, a piece of legislation that you know many of them, the leadership contenders, have said that they disagree with and can't support. So that's going to be what we all will be watching through November. Let's just, just be very clear too. Jason Kenney's government was doing things that it didn't promise to do in the last election. It was keeping more promises than it made on things like strip mining the Rockies and a massive overhaul of the social studies curriculum. What happened in each of those instances, and I have a list of 10 others, Albertans got upset. They called their MLAs and those MLAs in caucus turned those measures around. So you're asking what what can what, who can stop this? I love your barriers are great. The biggest barrier to this, the biggest barrier to, if, if Albertans are really upset, is to go through their MLAs. It worked. So let's do another Zoom question. Uh, I think this one's been covered already, but I'll, I'll ask it again. Uh, I think this is more a question of political morality than constitutionality. Uh, so why is it considered unreasonable? democratically speaking, for an elected provincial body to protect its populace from the will of unelected or external entities attempting to enforce laws that may be found to be unconstitutional or hostile to the interest of those constituents. Because they're not external entities. They live in a federation, right? Where Albertans elect two sets of, of representatives. And to me, this the, 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 what's really lying at the heart of a lot of this is a failure of losers consent. I get a sense that a lot of people that are supporting actions like the Sovereignty Act are tired of losing. I'm not calling them losers, let's be clear. I'm saying they're tired of losing, and why wouldn't they be? Last two provincial elections, we've sent almost all, all of our, in, last, well, in 20, 2019, sent all of our M MPs to opposition benches, and just about all of them in, in 2021. I get the impulse that, we're that, that some Albertans feel like they'll never have uh, influence in, in Ottawa. 
but it's it's you know, to take another step and to say we're not going to recognize the legitimacy and the ability of that government to legislate it is is a bridge too far for me, right? Do we take another audience question right here? Um, I was born in this province. I'm an alumni of this university. I've lived around Canada. I'm back now. And tell me what I need to understand about Alberta to be for there to be a sovereignty act in the first place. Because I don't get it. Things are of both the return of the oil industry, things are pretty good here. And you know, a small cabal of political science nuts wants to blow things up. And it could happen, or we could be on a road to it as, as soon as Thursday night. And uh, I think Albertans, just so I can inject my own opinion, I think Albertans will come to the senses and reject this nonsense. I'm going to go back to the public opinion work that, that Jared and I have done, and, and it, it basically says support for this kind of an idea, right? And, and we don't have data specifically on the Sovereignty Act, but support for the idea of Alberta separating from, from Canada exists. Um, it's consistent. It's about one in five, right? But, but that's as far as it goes. And, and I don't think that there, you know, that, that much as there is frustration, um, you know, in, in certain sectors of the province with various federal policies and, you know, with federal taxation and so on, I don't think that this turns into widespread support for this particular idea. Um, you know, that, that's my sense, but we'll see, right? We're, we're gonna see over the next few months. I think we could do, we have time for one more in-person audience question. Does anybody else have a question? In Alberta, we have a minister who says he will not comply with the federal government's gun control legislation. And other provinces are falling, falling suit. How is that going to play out? And is that an example? Sovereignty. Yeah, thanks for that question. And I, I think it's been interesting this week because that whole dynamic for some of claiming, and I think Ms. Smith herself is claiming, that's the kind of sovereignty act that work. Um, I don't think it is. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, the federal government has articulated a buyback program for weapons and said that the RCMP who function as Alberta's provincial police should be taking those uh, or, or being the recipients of that or involved in that program. Alberta has said, and there's provincial authority over its provincial police force, which is the RCMP becomes the Alberta provincial police force when we contract with the RCMP and the federal government for their services. The provincial government says, well, I, I don't think you federal government can direct the operations and engage our provincial police officers in a program, program. And they might be right about that. Um, what they're not right about is saying guns are provincial jurisdiction, they're property. That part is wrong. We know that, that guns may be property also, but the Supreme Court of Canada has clearly said that the federal government can legislate in relation to firearms. And if the federal government legislates in relation to those firearms, making them illegal or compelling people to sell them, then we're talking about a different story. Police officers have to uphold the law. That I think is true. But I do think it's open for the province to say, this federal program doesn't get to take up the time and, and energies of our provincial police force. That's different from saying we're not following a federal law or we're going to reject the existence of, you know, a criminal code provision, um, which is what the Sovereignty Act says they can do. Um, this is good old fashioned federalism and the province and the federal government should talk about what's the right way to do this. They may disagree, but they 
they should come to some kind of resolution about, about how that program should operate. Um, that's not the Sovereignty Act at work. I think that's federalism at work. And just maybe to illustrate that, if the announcement had been, we, you know, this, the ban on these particular firearms doesn't apply in Alberta, um, and we're directing the RCMP, if they find somebody, you know, holding one of these guns, um, they, they can't charge them, right? That would be the, the logic of the Sovereignty Act, saying this is a law that is contrary to Albertans' interests, and so it just doesn't apply here. So we're going to direct the police not to enforce it. So that's the distinction. It's um, the, the distinction between, you know, the, how you direct the police to spend their time, you know, time is a finite resource, versus saying laws don't apply here. And, and there's so, you know, the, it's right on that edge. So I understand the, the question, yeah. So we are out of time. By out of time, I mean about 20 minutes over time. <laughs> thanks everyone for sticking with us through this. Uh, I'd just like to close with uh, a word of thanks to everyone that made this event possible. Uh, so in particular to our three panelists, Lisa, Jared, and Eric, I think everyone should put, put their hands together. Uh, a huge thank you then to everyone who joined us tonight, to everyone in person and everyone who's joining us on Zoom. Uh, and a huge thank you to the Centre's other staff members, uh, Aubrey, Baya, and Zara, Anna, for uh, working so hard to make this event the best possible version of itself. Uh, so if you enjoyed tonight's event, uh, I hope you'll come and visit us online uh, at constitutionalstudies.ca or on Twitter uh, to find out more about who we are, uh, what we do, uh, and for a whole treasure trove of resources in Canadian constitutional law. So that's all for now. Uh, thank you again to everyone, uh, and we hope that we'll see you next time.